going to start recording. Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're just letting folks in the room. It'll just be a moment as everyone comes in. Um, thank you all so much for being with us this evening. It's wonderful to have you in our, in our virtual room together. We're so happy to have you um, in this conversation about Juneteenth. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Sari Kamen. I am the Public Programs Director of MOFAD. We are the Museum of Food and Drink. We're based in New York. Uh, however, for the past almost year and a half now, we have been completely virtual um, because of the pandemic. We've been doing lots of virtual programs since I guess March, 2020. Um, I don't even know, this is probably like our 200th um, but it still feels so meaningful and we're still so grateful to have folks like you coming from all over um, to join us and still feel like, you know, we have a sense of community despite not being in the same physical space. So we are very, very grateful for that. Um, tonight, the program is obviously centered around Juneteenth and we have a professor, historian from Galveston, Texas, where everything happened. And we have two chefs also from Texas. So we are really, really honored to hear, you know, first person stories, uh, legacies and experience from folks who are living, breathing, um, celebrating the meaning of what Juneteenth is through their work, through their cooking. And um, I am especially honored that uh, this is happening because of, on behalf of MOFAD, our upcoming exhibition is African slash American, Making the Nation's Table. We are so excited for it to open when it does open, which will hopefully be at some point um, in the late fall or early winter. It will be in the Africa Center, which is a cultural institution in New York City. It's right in Harlem. Um, we have so much that we want to share with you, all these untold stories of African Americans who um, really make the point that, that African American food is American food. So um, without further ado, I'd really like to introduce our panelists this evening so they can start the show. How about I start with Chef Chris Williams? Hello all, um, thanks for having me. I'm Chris Williams, I'm the chef and owner of uh, Lucille's in Houston. The founder and executive director of Lucille's 1913, our nonprofit, which <clears throat> has been uh, combating food insecurity and employment opportunities and waste. Uh, today we've donated over 285,000 meals to those in need in Harris County and Fort Bend County and beyond. Um, and also the founder of Lucille's Hospitality Group, which is about to open a new restaurant in August. Well, now it's in November, named late August with uh, the amazing <laughs> chef Don Burrell, who's uh, currently on Top Chef right now, killing it. Awesome, thank you, Chris. Uh, chef Joy. I'm also muted aside from being Joy Chevalier. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Joy Chevalier. And Born and raised in Houston, but I live in Austin, Texas. I am the founder and owner of The Cook's Nook, uh, which is a culinary incubator. We help uh, food companies get started and get launched. I started and founded that after 18 years as a technologist and years as an academic. Um, and The Cook Nook, Cook's Nook uh, not only works with academics, we also work with corporates on their uh, new products and development, but we also have a food services group as well. And uh, last year, we provided almost 250,000 meals in the Austin Travis County area. This year, we're on track to about 310,000. Um, and we've also uh, made our food available in, um, in retail stores for folks to also enjoy, particularly in neighborhoods uh, who do not have grocers and, and food access. And I am a member of the Dons de Scofier and on the board of Naturally Austin, a part of the Naturally Network for CPGs, companies, and I'm also on the board of the Austin Travis County Food Policy Board. That's it. That's it. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Joy. And I'm going to pass it over to our moderator, uh, Dr. Carol Davis. I just quickly want to mention that we're going to have some time at the end for Q&A using the chat function. So if you wouldn't mind just holding questions for our panelists, we will definitely make time for that. Um, so that'll come after the two cooking demos, which will happen after the panel conversation. So Dr. Carol Davis, please take it away. Thank you. So I'm uh, Carol Bunch Davis. I'm Assistant Vice President for Academic Affairs and an Associate Professor of English 
at Texas A&M at Galveston. Um, my research is around um, 20th century Black cultural production, and my most recent work is uh, around really the cultural history of Black Galveston and its relationship to space and place. So I'm really excited about this conversation. And so I'll just go ahead and dive in. And I do want to know behind me, my, my virtual background is um, Absolute Equality, which is a mural that is being dedicated at one of the spots where um, the uh, Juneteenth happened, and one of three spots where General Granger and the 2000 troops that came to Galveston to announce two and a half years later after the Emancipation Proclamation uh, that 250,000 enslaved people were free. So, uh, you know, I want to begin really thinking about Juneteenth's legacies and, you know, what they are for you personally. Um, and so I'll start with Chef Joy. Uh, can you share with us when you really came to understand Juneteenth's significance and, you know, did that come from family lore and celebrations or did it come from elsewhere? I know for many of us, I've had conversations with other folks, for Black folks in particular, that some of us did not learn about this. Uh, you know, I've, I've had the, I was today years old conversation, uh, what I learned. So I'm wondering how you came to it. And, and then, you know, Chef Chris, if you would, after Chef Joy finishes. Sure. Well, you know, I, I think like many others in this, in that region, this region, I'm, I'm in Austin, I keep thinking that this region, Houston, um, you know, um, it was family story and family lore and family understanding that something uh, significant happened and it's marked on June 19th, that that story was very personal story, that something happened to people like us and to our family. And so it was, it was part of family knowledge and cultural knowledge around our neighborhood. Um, and, you know, I really didn't see it written in a book until, well, seventh grade Texas history, when we all take Texas history. And that was the first time I saw something that sort of explained about General Granger, that something happened, and this is what it's called, and exactly the sort of factual details. But the family story was, this is the day that Black people became free uh, in Texas, and that affected us. Um, so yeah, that's how I, that's how it sort of came to my understanding as a, what, five, six, seven, eight-year-old. How about for you, Chef Chris? Um, yeah, it was something that was discussed and mentioned in the church, uh, but it wasn't anything that was celebrated. <clears throat> Um, and you know, until today, it wasn't a holiday, so it's a everybody still had to work. Uh, but we, we we knew the history behind it. But you, you know, I what my family's 180 years deep in Texas, um, <clears throat> and for the most part, entrepreneurs um, throughout their history here. I don't know how they pulled that off, but they did. Uh, so it, 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 it had a, it ran kind of differently with us um, as far as like the acknowledgement of it. But yeah, it's something that we were hyper aware of from a very young age. And so, you know, uh, sort of continuing off of what you just said, you know, what is its meaning for you now? You already mentioned entrepreneurship. Clearly, uh, you have some experience, some personal experience yourself with that. Can you talk about what its sort of legacy is for you now in the current moment? Well, I mean, outside of the obvious, which is that, you know, we were awarded freedom to, to, to do what every other human on the planet is able to do. Um, it, it, there, somebody was quoting, it was Tanya or Toya from the other night. She quote, quoted Martin Luther King and saying that black people were freed, uh, emancipated in the, in the famine. You know what I mean? So it's like you just had, it's like, so you build this wealth for this country for free, and then you're freed to do what? <laughs> right? Like to do what? So you just have to work three times as hard uh, just to find the, the, the basic comfort. I mean, just to survive, really. Um, the land <clears throat> wasn't awarded. We had to work for other people. I mean, we know that whole history. It's just, uh, it's kind of a, it's, it's, it's a dark reality that of, of Juneteenth for me. I mean, of course, for those people that were emancipated that day, it's everything. 
but the following day it's like you have nothing um and that's you know i don't want that to be lost on anybody and then the fact that it wasn't that long ago either yeah 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 i would i i agree with chris it's it's this sort of i think about when you're telling a young person about this that it's a day where freedom and recognition is happening for people, which means that there wasn't recognition before. You have to explain the other part too. And then, you know, how do you explain that to someone young? Um, that there were these people and they were enslaved. Well, what is that? And what does that mean? Um, and then they weren't, and then what happened, right? We still have another 100 years of reconstruction in Jim Crow, you know, immediately after that, where what gains families tried to do you know, whether it was acquire land or be employed or to gain money from employment was, you know, continuing to be systematically destroyed or taken from them, mm -hmm. right? And so you always have to tell both parts, but I, I don't think that changes um, the understanding of joy and, uh, say joy, I think that's probably the best part in, understanding that there's a, an opportunity change for your family and the family's growth and uh, the family's state and status. And I think we were all aware of that. Something happened to us and to our family and uh, in that time frame, And that has to be a positive thing, even though there's something else behind it. I love that, that you, you actually, that's a beautiful segue into another question that I have. <laughs> Um, because I was um, taking a look at, at Tony Tipton Martin's Jubilee, and there's a quote very much, you know, tied to what you just said, we have earned the freedom to cook with creativity and joy. And so I wonder, Chef Joy, you know, what does joy look like for both of you uh, in, in cooking and what you're doing? Um, I'll go, I mean, just real quick, because you could talk about this part all day. I mean, you know, I loved academia in a corporate job to open a culinary incubator and try to share and develop with others the win-win of being able to create the thing that you want to create with passion and have it actually benefit you and your family, um, to create intergenerational wealth, to create whatever it is that you want to create and have it be successful. I mean, at the end of the day, that's what the core part of entrepreneurship is. And, and, and to encourage and teach ownership uh, food, uh, you know, socioeconomic strength is built in part on food and the health that you gain through that food and that family gains through that food, right? So being in control of that food, <laughs> whether you do it by ownership or by access is essential. And these days I get to talk about both sides of that, ownership and access. And the Cook's Nook, I think, in some ways represents that belief system that we have to own it, um, that it brings economic health and prosperity within our family units and with our communities and tries to restore some of that or find a path to restore some of that um, mm -hmm. that, has been, that has been removed. Did I realize that when you know, I was leaving my corporate job, you know, that it would be beneficial, yes, but to the extent that it's tied to something very old, um, I don't think I realized that until the last few years, especially as we've gotten working more in access and insecurity and with, uh, with the entrepreneurs very directly. Mm. And for you, Chef Chris, what does joy look like? <clears throat> well, I mean, if, even if you think back to the days of slavery with all the information that's coming out um, now about the chefs and you know, how talented they were, who they were, the fact they had no choice in whether or not they were gonna cook for their, for their enslavers. Mm -hmm. That was the one place they had a chance to express their freedom, which is through their culinary mastery. Um, and so uh, I, that, I, that's the same for me to this to, today, um, because of course there are a lot of limitations that come along with um, the expectations of what African-American food ways are supposed to look like and all that kind of stuff. But um, through my experience working all over the world and then now at my, this restaurant here and 
the, the one there in Houston and the one that I'm about to open up here in Canada, um, <clears throat> it's a, the best example of that. Because what we're doing here, and what I'm going to show you today, which we'll talk, I'm sure, we're, we're definitely, mm -hmm. but is um, we're, it's going to, it's a Solomon Gundy recipe, which is that we're doing in a restaurant that's celebrating Nova Scotian ingredients with Lebanese influences. And um, th this isn't new, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, like we've been masters of all different types of cuisine. It's just not expected. It's definitely not discussed. Um, but that doesn't mean that it can't happen. So it's like an inherent freedom that comes with cooking because it's all about, is it delicious or is it not? Right. We don't care what you're doing. This is a yeah. great idea. Right. And you picked up, again, with the segues, you picked up on exactly what I wanted to point to in that fantastic docu-series, High on the Hog. And their <laughs> quote is, limitations by people's framing on what Black hands can do. And I just, I wanted to see if, if both of you could elaborate on how that sort of, there's an iteration of that in your experiences. And Chef Chris, you've just spoken to it a bit. And that also ties to another question I was going to ask about migration. But would you uh, elaborate on that a bit? And then Chef Joy? Yeah. Um, well, I guess the best way to, to to sum it up. And was that a quote that you just read? I, that was. <laughs> was, that, was that my quote? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> but um, when it, when it, uh, the, the simplest way to, 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 to make this point is, and I've used this example before, but if you take the New York Times, right? The New York Times writes to the self-proclaimed most liberal, most educated audience on the planet. You know, whether or not that's true, who knows? But that's how, that's how their audience feels about themselves. Um, and so when they put out a piece talking about 16 chefs changing the American culinary scene, but they limit, the, the, they frame these restaurants into these three or four concepts or iterations that then takes that audience that, that considers themselves to be the most woke. And now they're like, okay, so that's what black cooking is. Mm -hmm. It's one of these four things. So it's unintentional. I don't believe it's, I mean, maybe it is by design. I don't know, that's a different kind of conversation. But that right there is what limits people's expectations when they come to my restaurant. You know what I mean? Like you come in and you have an expectation. Okay, so you're doing it. These black hands are doing it. So where, 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 where's my yams or whatever? They, they expect to, to get up in there. It's because that's just what's been served up to them for so long. Even though they're culinary masters all over the planet, they look just like me, like masters. And they get no shine. So that's the limitation I'm talking about. It's, 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 it's just it's shrinking people's um, <clears throat> um, opportunity to really like experience something new and different or something great. You know, it, it changes just because of what they're, because now they, they you know, they, they see you. So now this is what it has to be. It's in that box. This is what it's supposed to look like. Right. Chef Joy? Yeah, I, I would say, I would totally agree because I would just pull it to the, uh, the act of, of entrepreneurship and ownership and who is allowed or believed to be, to own or who, uh, what does entrepreneurship look like and who does that and can innovative entrepreneurship and work and, on, and, and innovative concepts and ownership come out of the black community. I mean, even people are surprised. Chris, Chris can talk about people being surprised at the amazing food and the, and the breadth of, of food that he can discuss, experience, and presents to his audience. And we say the same thing about even just owning. You know, I still experience people who would say, oh, what is the concept? Oh, and you own that? And you have a degree in English and one in Latin and you were doing X and then you were at tech, technology companies and it, well, it just doesn't, it doesn't make any sense, right? And they don't meet people like us or like this conversation to, and, and that constantly surprises me and I'm constantly surprised that they're surprised, <laughs> right? Because any group, any culture, any group of people are not monolithic. Neither is the food or the concepts or the economics or any, any of that for that matter. So you're constantly dispelling something. Yeah. 
and you know, to to go back a bit to sort of the regional perspective, right? Like that you're you're balancing this idea uh, that many of us have about what Texas is and what Texas looks like, right? That that but that's somehow in the mix, and you're you know teasing out those pieces. And I'm you know I'm wondering, uh, you may or may not have uh, seen historian Annette Gordon reads on Juneteenth, and she talks about you know, her experience at sort of the intersection of the big thicket and the piney woods and the coastal bend and all of these regions in Texas and how that shapes, you know, how her family celebrated. So, you know, not only barbecue, um, but she talks about barbecued goat and tamales and other, you know, all of these things that, that many of us who've been in Texas for a long time understand that, you know, it's this, it's an incredible blend. So I wonder, you know, first, do you see those kinds of influences, right, a, a specific sort of regional influence? Um, and that second, is there something that might make, even though we're trying to get away from the monolith, that might make your the, the things that you are creating quintessentially Texan or American? I'll let Chris go first with that since he's got, he's in restaurant world. And I hear I was waiting on you. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, I mean, of course, like with our restaurants and, and any kind of regional cuisine, <clears throat> I mean, that's just it. It's all based off of what is ex easily accessible to you, what grows from that land. And that's why it changes um, from place to place. The techniques and then the, the ingredient then determines the techniques typically. Um, and so, of course, we're right next to Mexico and, I, the, and Texas is not the South when it comes to food ways, right? Like it's, yeah. it's, it's its own thing. Um, a lot of Mexican influence and a lot of German influence and, and definitely a lot of <clears throat> us with West Indian influence right. and everything else. Um, so yeah, and, and this is not, this is not a, a new phenomenon either. I mean, like if you even take my, I don't know if I mentioned this the other night, but even if you take my great grandmother's cookbook, which was published in 1941 and she started the work in the twenties, she had a recipe for guacamole in there she spe that she spelled out phonetically so that people <laughs> would know how to pronounce this foreign concept that she was introducing to them in 1941. Um, and that recipe still works to this day. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's your standard, you got your cilantro, you got your avocado, you got all these things. And she's not having it shipped in from, from Tijuana. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's there. That's why it's in her cookbook. She's just yeah. utilizing what was there. So I, I think, the, 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 the access sequence is really determined. Everything's born from that. Yeah. Yeah, I would, I mean, that's absolutely the case, you know, in my own family's history. And you'll see, it, I think you'll see the food that we're doing, that the, the, the items that we're going to do tonight. Um, you know, growing up, my family was from East Texas, from, you know, we talked about this, one of the, you know, one of the Friedman colonies. And then other parts were from right on the other side of the Sabine in, in Louisiana. And you know, that, and, and I grew up on the coast. I, I, I can't help but, you know, have those elements of something, you know, the vegetables of East Texas. That's what my grandparents ate. Her, her house was vegetable forward and vegetables that a lot of people don't eat, <laughs> you know. Um, and, you know, you're going to see those things always in the things that I end up tossing out, you know, when I have to do events or, or especially items where, I'm, you know, you're called on to do that. Um, you know, even even in our, our our meals, our food program that we're doing with the city and the county, um, you know, those are even vegetable forward too to try to convince folks. And some of the recipes are old recipes that we're we sort of bring back and, and put in front of folks. Um, and there's always cilantro. I mean, I still grew up in the coastal Catholic church. <laughs> you right. know, you know what that means, right. and in a Creole Catholic church. And, you know, there's tortillas around. They always were, always have been, and tamales always will be. You know, when I travel, travel around the globe and I come home, the first thing I end up at is a place here in town called Enchiladas y Mas. That's like home. I need to go eat. That's what I'm eating, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, uh, and jalapeno and different, and different elements, because like Chris said, those are the things that's here. Those are the things of the communities that we, we're in and, our, our friends, you know, extended friends, extended family, those things get included in your in your own cooking, and, and you can't get a, you don't get away from them. You just you just don't. Right, right. 
Um, so I have one other question I wanted to, to touch on, and you both have been deeply involved with providing economic opportunities for BIPOC folks. And I just wondered if you could talk about, you know, how that might connect to your ideas about Juneteenth legacy um, and, and maybe what some of the challenges have been around doing that. And I, I think in some ways there's a terrific book that just came out, um, a, a couple of local historians, The Lost Restaurants of, of Galveston's uh, African-American Community. And, you know, I, I felt like a lot of those restaurateurs, particularly Courtney Murray, it was very much in line with what Chef Chris is doing with it's, you know, that, that there's a sort of history there. So I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. Do you see it as, as um, you know, again, sort of an iteration of what we've seen um, in our history prior to Chef Chris, you talked about entrepreneurship within your own family. So can you speak to that a bit? Um, we're speaking to like the empowerment of employing people from our own community. Is that-, is that, is that Absolutely, what? yes. Okay. Um, well, this is something, so with the restaurant, it's, 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 a, it's two different things, right? So like when it comes to restaurant business, like you're looking for skilled labor, people that have already been given an opportunity, <clears throat> know what this life is like um, and want in. Uh, this is not something that people off the, you know, you, you don't just come off the street typically and get into this and, and make it because it's pretty nasty work. <laughs> <laughs> You sweat, you bleed, you cry, you fight. Like this is this is restaurants. Um, so even though since we've been and we've been open what nine years, and I've been in this industry for twenty five years, uh, there's not a big representation of us. It's really not. And I and I have to associate it with just our our not so distant history. You know what I mean? Like just how we look at this kind of work and. Where's the gratification? Do we really want that? Do, do we want to, you know, it's, it's just, it's a lot of psychological chains of what are the trauma that we've gone through that plays, that gets us to this point. So that, that's, that was and continues to be a struggle to get my own community involved in, in what I'm doing at the restaurant. Um, but the great thing is, is that it kind of bled into like this want to get us involved and get and give us the opportunities to come in and do it and have a um, like a low level point of entry that we can come in with no experience that they gave birth to 1913 and we're now um, by the end of this year we'll have employed um i think it'll be 70 like it's a good number of people that have never worked in this industry and they're gonna we're gonna be able to get them and the way that we get them to buy into it is that for one <clears throat> excuse me uh, they, they walk in with no experience and they get paid $12 an hour off the jump, right? $12 an hour, which is, I, I think minimum wage is seven twenty five. dollars I don't know. Nobody that works for me allows me to pay it. So I have no idea what minimum wage is, but so they're, they're coming in at $12 an hour and they get the benefit of knowing that the work that they're doing benefits their community. So like they're directly contributing to the comfort and the food security of their own community. So it's two types of buy-in, you know what I mean? Like you have the buy-in from your family saying, listen, you better go get that money. And then you have the buy-in from the community, like saying, we're so thankful for what you're doing. So it, bring, it, re, it introduces dignity back into trade, which I think has been lost for, for a long time. Back before desegregation, we used to be completely self-sustained and whatever kind of trade you had, you were an asset. Now it's just all about instant gratification, quick money and large money and no real <clears throat> um, consideration of anything past that. So we're reintroducing that, reintroducing that. And, um, and I'm happy to say, like, we have zero turnover. <laughs> like, everybody's coming to this program, and we're, we're working people, like, where you're getting, we're starting from seed to harvest to, pr to production, well, to, to processing the vegetables that we're growing, then to large-scale production to make these mills that go out from scratch every single day to delivering them, and then we take it all the way to the fermentation lab. And so everybody that's been involved in this process has fallen in love with it. And I don't know if it's because they're true masochists like I am who just really like to hurt and suffer or if they just really love the benefit of what they're doing. Um, whatever it is. I, I mean, like these it. are not mutually exclusive. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> Joy? Yeah. I, I think I, 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 I tied that, that legacy of restoring ownership. And I think that is, that is just significant. <laughs> We know that when we change or someone changes their wage, their status, uh, 
it affects their entire household, or particularly women. It changes everything. That ripples through generations. I mean, we are the product of things that happen where someone previous to us changed things, right? right. Um, and so how do, we, how do we restore what was taken with the skills that we have? Um, products and food have always been in our community. How do we get them to break out and be on shelves and have big return to them, right? Um, and, and have them be public and have them be able to change a, change a family or change a community, right? That's the kind of thing we talk about. We talk about food entrepreneurship and we talk about ownership. And I say food entrepreneurship, it's really business ownership, right? Because that person now owns a food business, right? And that's huge. That's huge. I mean, we've seen products that have been knocked about in the community and people in the community supported and then uh, you push them through with incubation and other stuff. And the next thing you know, they're regional. And then they have the opportunity to go national and be on a shelf, right? Um, that's, that's massive. And so, you know, if we're restoring little bits of Black Wall Street, <laughs> uh, I'm completely with that. Um, and have that have a generational, a generational effect. You know, on the food insecurity side, we know that parents will go for forego food uh, for their children. In Travis County, 24% of children are food insecure. And it's very hard to deal with the other issues in a household when people are worried about where their next meal is coming from, but they haven't had anything solid or decent in the day. It's very hard to do any other things that you need to do beyond surviving, but then how do you get to a point to be able to thrive to get to the point where you can start to change what's happening, what's happening in the household, right? And so coming at it from both of those directions, to me, is continuing that legacy and having the answer, I think, that Chris talked about, what happened the next day after, after, uh, after Juneteenth. And people went out to build, and then there was a strategic attempt to destroy and then how do we restore that and try to do that in, in a couple of different ways within the community and then lastly you know us doing the same by by employing and employing those um, who are new in this industry and those who are both skilled they're both in our in our facility um, in the food group uh, very specifically um, and so and so yeah I mean there's there's nothing but you create, hopefully, a cycle of continuing positivity and development that is available, available to the community by having companies like this. It's a win-win. It's a win-win across the board. And I think that's what we as individuals, I'm going to speak for you here, Chef, that's what we want. Right. There's no, down, there's no downside. When right. Get right. It's tran transformational. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I know we've got to move on to the actual demonstrations. I, I did, I, I had sort of a, a joking question. I really was interested in, you know, I, in our local newspaper, we just had the, the Juneteenth spread. Food, you know, so watermelon, tomato salad, and, you know, the, the, the red velvet cake, the everything. And I, I just wondered. What's uh, with red velvet cake? Well, I was hoping that maybe you both could speak to that for us and to, and to think about, you know, I think it goes back to something we discussed earlier about, you know, those sorts of boxes and what the food is supposed to look like. And, um, you know, people, I was on a discussion the other day where someone was asking about, you know, what are the authentic, scare quotes, foods? And, and so, um, you know, in thinking about your, the, the recipes, the, you know, the dishes that you're going to prepare, um, how do they, do they align with, do they diverge from, you know, these sort of, um, you know, again, frameworks, the, uh, you know, expectations that people might have, is this, is, are you departing from some of those expectations and, and what you're going to serve? So I just want to get, dispel the red velvet cake thing. And 
remind people that that's a post-war cake. <laughs> um, that's, that's a late cake. And, you know, Adam's extract here in Texas, and actually not too far from here, a huge facility, uh, started to be able to create a red dye that was commercially retail available. But that's a, that's a relatively recent cake. That's post-war. That's, that's 50s, 60s, 70s cake that, that, that became very popular. So I just want to toss that bit out there. Okay. <laughs> toss that bit out there. Uh, but I yeah. think for people... Oh, sorry. Do you want to go, Chris? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Please continue. Well, I was just going to say, I know I, I do understand that people have heard and understand of the significance of red. And, you know... You know, red comes back to understanding the sacrifice and, and spilling of blood that happened for better part of three centuries, you know, uh, to Black people here. And so uh, having something red, uh, you know, and it's become associated with Juneteenth, uh, manifested in, firstly, in the red drink, red beverage. But even that is a form of, you know, Chris mentioned about the Caribbean and the Indies, is that hibiscus beverage, right? That a lot of people, a lot of families, you know, uh, had access to, you know, a flower, and a, a, a flower that people experience in sorrel, right? Um, and take that and turn that into, what do you do in the South? You turn that into a tea, right? <laughs> and that tea is color. And you add a little bit of sugar, a little bit of ginger, and it is a beverage that, harkens back to something else from a from a flower from a herb that's old and familiar right now that gets dragged into other areas and other arenas but it's not everything in the universe that's red right that that drink was very was very specific um you know but in general you know for me you know how did how you know were there specific foods you know, we didn't have specific foods. Um, we did eventually, I mean, again, other than, well, I'll take that back. My family, as I mentioned, grew up in Houston and parks were segregated. I think we've talked about this before. And my family was in Fifth Ward and the park that, uh, you know, uh, during Jim Crow that people went to was Finnegan Park, which is still there. And, uh, and so when my grandmother in her picnic basket, I'm gonna show it to you, uh, with, take the family to Finnegan Park for Juneteenth, which they did do. Let me grab something. Just because it's super cool. Oh, this wow. is my grandmother's original. This is her picnic basket that I still have. Um, but they would go to Finnegan Park like you know, some families did. And, and Juneteenth was very much a family experience because the story affected the existence of your own family. Right, it was not a party as, 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 as Chris mentioned, but they would go to Finnegan Park and they would take to Finnegan Park things like uh, fried chicken, you know, things that are safe and good to, to travel. And you know, that's you know, a story of the diaspora generally. But macaroni and cheese or her macaroni and salad, wrapped sandwiches, you know, and wax paper uh, for snacks and, you know, a pound cake, slices of pound cake wrapped in wax paper um for dessert and that was that was pretty pretty standard for them uh, my grandmother loved macaroni salad i can't tell you why um however you know as i grew up in houston um it was less going to the park and the and that that experience of being in the park in the space with other families not that you did anything with those families necessarily but it's just that all the people recognizing they were all in the park together in their family units right? okay. And, you know, by the time I came along, um, my grandfather did barbecue. Um, and um, it was special. It was, you know, we eat barbecue so much now, but barbecues were special. Right. You know, really got barbecue when I was young, maybe three, four times a year. Okay. Maybe, right. Wow. It was not regular because it was work and it was all day. Yeah. And it was great. Um, and Juneteenth was one of those times, along with maybe Fourth of July Memorial Day. Outside of that, yeah. they were not standing around barbecuing. <laughs> well, no. 
Chef Chris, what about for you? So this idea of, of sort of, you know, again, I'm scare quoting, authentic Juneteenth fair. Um, well, as far as what I'm making today, the only, I have some red chilies. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I've heard about the red and it totally makes sense. Um, but we just have to remember that <clears throat> when it comes out to this, this messaging and the framing of even this, which is now a holiday, we right. weren't masters of even getting that word. You know what I mean? Like, so there are, there are a lot of things to consider with how this stuff gets around. That, yeah. I mean, I don't want to seem like I'm just a total skeptic of everything, but I'm kind of a total skeptic of everything. <laughs> 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 You're right. I, we, I, I don't, yeah. I, yeah, and I just, I, I know that. And another thing to consider is that, I mean, with these families, and if you think about the genesis of the, of the celebration, which had to be done extremely quietly, you're thinking about the people who were doing that, they didn't have the luxury of choice. Right. You know what I mean? Like they're, they're, if they're eating, they're eating what they're able to produce. Right. Um, so I really think that <clears throat> these narratives, the only, one, the only one that's really true to me, and that's <laughs> the day that it hit Texas, and what happened immediately after. Those are the only things I know to be a, a fact. Right. Yeah. You know, I can- I, 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 And I, I generally agree. I, I guess why I was dispelling about red velvet cake is this the idea that it's everything red is just not sure where that sort of came into, into you know, it's pop culture, I guess. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, so can we, you want to transition now into the demonstrations we've been, this has been fantastic, but we do want to actually let people see. <laughs> uh, oh, you actually want to see food? Yes, how about that? So, um, Chef Chris, are you going to start us off? Yeah. <clears throat> so, and mine's um, very simple because I'm not in my kitchen. I'm not in my country. I'm in Canada. Uh, supposed to be opening up our restaurant, but we're shut down up here. So what I'm doing is um, something that will be on our menu when we do open up next year. So this is Solomon Gundy, which is traditionally a West Indian dish um, that made its way into Nova Scotia. And this is a different iteration of it, but it still taps into those staple West Indian flavors, be it the Scotch bonnet and the uh, allspice, which is indigenous to uh, West Indian. Okay. Oh, to Jamaica, or West India, West okay. India, whatever. What, okay, you know what I'm trying to say, right? Yes. <laughs> So <clears throat> what we have is salted herring. Uh, Could you, well, can you talk a little bit, uh, I, I'm really interested in you, again, you alluded to it earlier, but you know, as you're prepping, can you talk a little bit about your my, sort of migration story? So I read the first stop was Chili's. That's what I read for you. Is that as, accurate? As far as my, my culinary career? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And and so from Chili's, I'm assuming in Houston, right? Yeah. Mm. Fired after two months. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I went from there. And I got addicted with the K by the chaos of of our business. I think I was 17 years old. I was 17, um, and I've been addicted ever since. So worked over at Chili's, and I went to a couple other restaurants at Boudreaux's, mm -hmm. <laughs> and didn't last long over there. Uh, <laughs> Went to college, didn't love it. Went to culinary school, loved it less. Went to Europe, worked out there for four years. Um, some people use the word train, but I had way too much fun to call it training. Right. Uh, and I lived everywhere from London to Lithuania, picking up all those things in my culinary toolkit. Then came back here where I am now, which is Canada. Worked for two years, uh, working on boiling potatoes and ham mm -hmm. um, for the cuisine. And then down the East Coast and made my way back to Houston to open up Usos. Okay. Yeah. Quite a trajectory there. Yeah, it's you know it's quite a ride, and we're still riding. I just drove up here from Houston. Oh wow! And it took seven days, and uh, eight COVID tests. Oh wow! <laughs> Canada is serious about keeping the Rona out of its borders, so okay. I'm quarantining right now. And the stuff that I'm working with, I had to have a friend out here deliver it to my door. And they dropped it and wouldn't let me come outside to pick it up until they were in their car pulling off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Um, wow. I don't know. They didn't know where you've been, so. Yeah, I'm with them. <laughs> you know, I, I'm one of those people that actually enjoys quarantine, so. <laughs> I, <was> like, <laughs> I, I, I secretly did, too, actually. Yeah. So let me just talk about this fish real quick. This is salted herring. Um, this is a fish that's abundant out here in Nova Scotia, Northern Atlantic. Uh, and like I was saying, the West Indian recipe, they would use salted cod, uh, which isn't abundant anywhere anymore. But this is a nice duration. So what we're doing is we're just slicing, <clears throat> getting the fillets off, discarding the bones. Mm -hmm. It's our little compost pot. And then if you can see, can you see uh, right here is where the majority of the bones are. So if you just slide your knife up under there, Cut that off. You have a boneless piece of fish. This is actually kind of fun prepping from a chair. I've never done it. <laughs> it's a little glimpse into my later years. And so <clears throat> this this fish, like I said, it's salted, so we soak it for uh a minimum of 12 hours. I do 24 hours because the salt is pretty strong. I want to taste the other flavors. Right. Change the water every eight hours or so. And then we're just going to do nice bite-sized chunks out of it. And let me know if I get off camera and you can't see. Well, you're good. That's, that's awesome. Look at that. It's really yeah. Good. Yeah. All right. And then This is all about knife work, really, uh, which is another reason why I like it, because it's so simple. It's knife work, and then it's just layering, and it's a pickled dish. Mm -hmm. And this is maybe something, I don't know if there'll be a market for this in Houston, but we will try it in our <laughs> fermentation lab. Right. Yeah, so all we do is just layer this, and you would let, let this sit ideally for about a, a week to let the flavors infuse. And I'll just show you everything that we have first. So we have red bird Thai chilies, because I like this dish a little bit spicy. Yellow onions, sweet yellow onions. Um, can you see that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. all my fish. Lemon zest, the scotch bonnet, mm -hmm. serrano and Fresno peppers, just for color, because I'm still a chef, I still believe in presentation. Green onions. Um, and this right here is the pickling liquid, which is made with malt vinegar, which is uh, used to be made out of ale, <clears throat> um, delicious natural vinegar with a little bit of rice vinegar to lighten it up a little bit. Allspice, which is an ingredient that I told you about, and mixed peppercorns just to add a little bit of heat and nuance to the flavor. Sugar, salt, and uh, a little bit of water. And so that's it. So now, and it's going to be really handy because, again, I don't have any of my tools, so. Um, you're just going to start layering this fish in, and you want to do it skin side up. And again, this goes back to presentation. And then we'll do, let me move this. What? No. And you'll throw a little bit of onions in. And another reason why. I'm doing this dish is because I mean, not only is it something that we're going to do up over here, is it not to existing Canadian <clears throat> um, Atlantic culture and the West Indian influence? Because I mean, Nova Scotia was also the end of the Underground Railroad. Right. There's a huge community out here called Africville. They even had their own hockey team um, as recently up until the 70s. Uh, and Oh, that's right. Yeah. And so it's because of that. And then also it's just a great summertime dish. It's light. It's refreshing. Um, it's just all good things that you want in June. And to be honest with me, like I, I that's what would determine the menu for me. <laughs> it's like, what's good in, in Texas weather. Right. <laughs> so that's our first layer. And then we just start packing this on and we just repeat. And I'll show you two more layers. Well, I don't think I really need to show you all the layers. I'll show you one more layer so you can see how it 
it comes together. And then I'll show you the finished product. Okay. And I'll present it. So typically this dish is served with uh, toasted rye bread. Okay. Um, and it's with, done with toothpicks. You eat it out of the jar with toothpicks. Okay. Uh, my buddy forgot the toothpicks. <laughs> so, <clears throat> but we'll be okay. A little scotch bonnet going on there. And you right. said this is for a day. This this sits for a day. It can sit. I mean, so this this thing can last. Okay. You can let it sit however long you want. I typically like because the the the, the pickling liquid that I use is lighter because mm -hmm. I want to taste the fish and I want to taste the vegetables. Um, I let it go a minimum of three days. Probably in our restaurant when we open up out here, we'll do five. Oh. And then we'll do a little bit of this mix, these mixed pickled pe peppercorns on top. And this is where we get messy. That's not so bad. You pour that on there. And typically what we do is we take this all the way up to the top. But so. Okay. So five days later. Five days later. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or in our case, 50 minutes. Uh, where is the okay, yeah. so and you have that. Amazing. It's it's I mean like it's it's really nice and light. It's 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 uh -huh. perfect. It's just nice and simple. So they would normally serve it on my bread, the way that we're going to do it is we're going to serve it on roti. Okay. In the restaurant. This is again another nod to where it came from. Right. And well, and you're saying, you know, you're talking about also where it came from, but also, you know, is that in some ways a nod to the incredible diversity of Houston as well? Well, so this is the Nova Scotian dish. Uh, via the West Indies. But it's just a it's a it's just a really a ode to the innovation of the African foodways, period. And how right. it's permeated in all cultures everywhere over the globe. Uh, yeah. Discussing last night, we were talking about Oaxaca, which is home to, and this is just basic cream cheese. Um, I'm actually excited. I shouldn't eat this yet, but I'm going to eat it. Uh, Oaxaca is home to the first free African community in all of the Americas. And I found out about Oaxaca just visiting there on a whim because I've always loved the food. And there was something mm -hmm. so familiar about it to me. And so as I started to research, I found out all this, all this history about Oaxaca and about the West African influence um, and about Gaspar Yanga, who actually led the revolt against the Spaniards for 40 right. years, right. where they gave up and awarded him his freedom in his village. And now in Oaxaca, there's a 40-foot black statue of Gaspar Yanga in the town that's named Yangaville or Yanga Town, Yanga Sound. Right. Uh, and that's just, a, you know, this is, in Mexico, I mean, people sleep on the power of the diet, you know, the, the, the nuance of Mexican cuisine, but truly some, one of the best restaurants, two of the best restaurants I've ever been to in the world, I, much like Joy, I just travel constantly consuming Michelin stars. <laughs> two of them are in, <laughs> two of them are in Oaxaca. Mexico. Oh, one in of them in Oaxaca. So, yeah, one in Mexico City, one in Oaxaca. Interesting. They are absolutely gorgeous. So I'm building this for you. That's beautiful, though. Look at that. We're almost done here. And who knew I could do this from a chair? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not mad. I know the first thing you learn in a culinary school is you don't get to sit in a chair in the kitchen. Come Never. on. <laughs> Ever. Ever. It's like you just, oh my gosh. I'm missing something. Oh, here we go. Like that's all right. Well, whatever, who cares? Yeah. So that's how you would serve this dish. And you would have just a couple of toothpicks and you just put it out there and just serve yourself up. So that's our new Solomon Gundy. And we can look forward to that at late August. 
No, this will be here at the Western Canada. I'm just, I'm trying to speak it into existence. <laughs> The restaurant in Canada, so late August will be in Houston. This one's for our Canadian restaurant that we're opening. It was supposed to open this year, but the world changed and slowed everything right. down. We'll be opening uh, next June. It's a seasonal okay. restaurant. Okay. Out here in Black Point, Nova Scotia. All right. The name of it's going to be a Mills Black Point. Well, not going to be. The name is a Mills Black Point Bistro. That looks fantastic. Thank you. Maybe there's some way we can get to taste that in Houston. I don't know if I'm going to be in Nova Scotia, but I can cross the causeway for Lucille's in late August, right? Well, yeah, we will do this in our fermentation lab, so you'll be able to come by and get a sample. Just okay. Let me in the okay, good. So, Chef Joy. So, I, like Chris, can't get away from fish. If you grow up on the Texas coast, you just grow up eating fish, and my grandfather would take me out at 4 a.m., when I was six and seven to go to Kima or mm. Seabrook, back when those were hard places to get to, right? Um, and fish. And so I'm going to make it uh, make something uh, that is sort of reminiscent of my grandparents. So we're going to have uh, some Texas fish, red fish, and we're going to make a beautiful quick slaw uh, to go with that, a kale slaw, all vegetable forward. And then we're going to make Texas caviar. Um, again, my grandmother's side was from East Texas and they basically grew what they wanted to eat, the vegetables that they had. And I grew up eating rutabagas. Nobody grows up eating rutabagas, but I grew up eating rutabagas. Um, and so um, that's what we're gonna put together very quickly. Hopefully the thing that takes the longest here is the fish that I probably should have put in already. So all I've got here is a piece of, uh, piece of red drum, one of my favorites. Okay. Um, four pieces here. Guys, I'm just getting a cup of coffee real quick. <laughs> he is a coffee drinker, you guys. I really am. <laughs> and I'm just going to give these pieces of fish just a dab of olive oil. When I say a dab, I mean a lot. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, a quick bit of olive oil. And then we're going to get these guys very quickly into an oven after a quick seasoning. Just a wipe of, wipe of the hands here. And, and we're going to season with one of my favorite things. Remember I talked about Louisiana? Yes. There we go. <laughs> Can't get away from it. I don't care where I go. There is a container of uh, Tony's Creole seasoning salt. Why, why Tony's over Lowry's? So, you know, it's just different. I grew up, grew up with both. Both are in the cabinet, I'll be honest. They're both in the, they're both in the cabinet. Mm -hmm. If I, I'll tell you, that's the secret ingredient to potato salad is Lowry's. Mm. So you did hear that, you did hear that from me. So in a pinch, you could Lowry's? <laughs> you could Lowry's if you really wanted to. A little salt, a little pepper, toted salt, and then, um, one last bit. Whoops, I just dropped something and a dash of garlic powder. Okay. And that's done. And we're going to, I've already sprayed this pan and we're just going to put it on a quick pan. Drop this in the oven. It shouldn't take very long. I've got this on a pretty, pretty quick 475 because I'm in the room. And then when we remove this, I will. Okay. So you know, I love redfish. Chef is on the I, last shelf. So when it's funny because talk about one of those things you just don't see that often. Redfish treated as as, as uh, sashimi. Uh, oh yeah. God, I'm having trouble with letters today. Um, I'm not had it on the half shell, but I've had it at treated as. Uh, sashimi mm -hmm. uh, with a bit of, uh, of uh, rice wine vinegar on it and peppers, very thin sliced bird, uh, bird peppers. Absolutely delicious. And you wouldn't, and again, you wouldn't think, I mean, red fish is just our, our fish, right? Mm -hmm. 
as Texas, Louisiana, Louisiana coast fish, but treated really delicately. Mm -hmm. right? It's just amazing, just amazing. So I've got a few things here um, <clears throat> like that, right? One of my favorites. We're gonna come to that in a second. So first thing we're gonna do is make the dressing for uh, a slaw. And I've tried to just basically pick things that folks would have in their cabinets. So uh, a basic slaw, I mean, a, a dressing for the slaw. Yep, that's a dab of mayonnaise. But again, Mexican crema. Ah, okay. Another one of my favorites. Just a little dab of that. A little bit of uh, side vinegar. See how that goes. May need a dab more. Just depends on the consistency you want. A little bit of celery seed. A little salt. I'll get that dash of pepper back again once more. I don't know if you guys can see that. Yeah. I'm gonna have just a little bit more of the vinegar. Get that smooth. And it works for just about any small that you like. Mm -hmm. Just a dab. There we go. Usually I would make this a couple hours ahead of time. Right. And then set it in the refrigerator. Let's set that there real quick. Okay. So we're going to make the slaw very quickly. Um, I've got a bit of kale. They call it a festival kale slaw. A little bit of kale that I've washed and cleaned. Got a little bit of parsley and a little bit of cilantro here as well. Uh, a little bit of cabbage. Need all of those. The idea is that this is crunchy, that it's light. A little bit of red cabbage. The beauty of vegetables is that they're all about nice skills, just like the chef was saying. Mm -hmm. All about the nice skills. I'm gonna cut just a dab of red onion, mostly because I've already got my, my yellow onion. My yellow, yellow onion is cut. Um, I will say, I just was looking through the comments and I saw people concerned about the heat of the scotch bonnet. <laughs> I just ate a delicious slice. The vinegar actually neutralizes that because the peppers mm -hmm. are seeded. They're seeded. So all we're getting is flavor. Mm -hmm. You get a little tinge of heat like a 16th note, just a little, well, but nothing that's lasting or painful. Um, I don't know if we take it to Croatia, but <laughs> for our palates here in the States, I think it's, it's more than manageable. You should, yeah, you should definitely give it a try. But the vinegar totally neutralizes that heat. All right, there we go. So I just added the red onion and uh, the carrot. And then we've got this. The dressing that we just made, it can tighten up a little. So add another little bit of vinegar. Mm. 
try to make sure I got everything in here. And then we'll just dress the salad here very quickly. It's not a ton of dressing, mm -hmm. but this is one of those things where you don't need a ton. And this is another thing I would sit back into the refrigerator. For how long? Oh, just. You know, I, would, I usually put this together maybe a half an hour or right before serving. All right, last bit. And I thought I was gonna be safe with the bowl that I had, but I think I'm going to get one more bowl and be a little bit safe about it. So um, for the last item, which is the Texas caviar. So Texas caviar is one of those one of those dishes very specific to here. It is a mix of the things of summer, uh, definitely out of the garden, just like the salad, the kale, uh, kale slaw is. Um, but in this case, it is your beans and peas and corn, uh, tomato, um, et cetera, tossed together. Um, made sure that it's dried. So if you can tell, there's no liquid on this. These are all dried peas and black beans. I decided to go with black beans instead of purple whole peas. Um, but black beans, um, say can't get away from that Latin influence in our state. Um, and all I've done is clean those and put those together here. And so a quick question about the purple whole peas. Like, so would you say that's a sort of East Texas? That is all East Texas. Yeah. That's crazy East Texas. Right, about the Texas caviar is that it is, you know, they're regional, again, sort of iterations and versions. So that makes it wholly East Texas. It was, it was very East Texas. Purple whole peas, corn straight off the, off the cob, sweet corn off the cob. Um, if you had any other peas or beans that you did, um, that, you know, that you would send your grandkids like me to go show. Hey, come hold, help your grandmother hold, uh, 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 you know, uh, shell the purple whole peas. And then the next thing you know, 10 minutes later, you're sitting there by yourself with an entire bushel. Yeah. Trying, right. to, uh, trying to get those done. And there's, a, there's a question, uh, are, the, are they dried? Are the purple whole peas dried? Are, are they dried? Oh, no, no, no. They're, they're typically fresh. I mean, you could turn those into a good, a good, uh, they're not usually dry. They're fresh. Usually when we deal with them, you're sitting there shelling peas and they go into a pot with, with ham or, or, or whatever else. And you have a good old, you know, pot of beans or stew, you know, or soup. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just added a little bit of bell pepper, sorry, or red bell pepper. And in this container, don't look, I've got green bell pepper, but I've also got oh, some jalapenos because I happen to be a fan. So <laughs> I hope you guys can see all, yeah. the, all of those in there. Okay. That looks terrific. Um, this is pretty straightforward. At this point, we're going to add some cumin. Just a little bit of cumin. Cumin is very here. I don't know. I don't know anybody who cooks whose household doesn't have cumin in it. Uh, a little bit of lime juice. Not much. Um, a little bit of garlic salt because I haven't salted this yet. But I'm going to prefer to use a little bit of fresh garlic. Just a dab. And I think I missed my yellow onions. So you can see this is all about the vegetables. It looks fantastic. It uh, is one of my favorite things to make. It's colorful. It never goes out of style. Um, and then the last two bits, a little bit of olive oil because you want to dress any salad. And then house favorite, a little bit of apple cider vinegar. And of course, you guys know that 
you could take that same vinegar, just like Chef was doing. And that's one of the reasons I think we really like doing these two. They were both about fish, but different ways of dealing with that vinegar. You could put this into a jar and basically can it. And people did. They canned peas. They canned all of their vegetables. My grandmother did um, with plenty of vinegar, you know. Uh, there's a question. Are you streaming from the Cook's Nook kitchen? No, we do not. Cook's Nook is, uh, no, Cook's Nook is more of, well, the entrepreneurs come in to make their products. Some of them are going to the grocery store shelves. Some of them are caterers, meal kit companies, um, wellness company, beverage companies. So they're all doing their thing. Um, and then my food services team is, of course, they're every day making those 2,800 to 3,000 meals. So it's more, a lot more institutional than it is sort of chef okay. But they put out amazing food and you can see uh, the kind of meals we're making on our Instagram, which is pretty cool. Um, but thanks for asking. I think they would die if they thought there was a camera inside. <laughs> All right. I only stepped away one moment. I'm gonna turn that, turn that, uh, that fish up just slightly. Now I had this. I think I'm actually gonna use it while I'm here because I happen to like, this is a fingerling, um, like a lemon drop. It is slightly, it is not a banana sport pepper. Um, it is a bit spicy. The jalapenos that I put in were not, but this, this will be. God, and my knife is extremely dull at this point in the day. And so, you know, I want to uh, quickly turn Chef Chris to you because there is a question and I, I think that I went a little bit long on the questions or, or back and forth, but um, the question is about the two restaurants that you mentioned in Mexico. Uh, someone would like for you to share those if you would. Yeah, in, um, in Oaxaca, am I on mute? No, I'm not. Okay, in Oaxaca, it's... Uh, Casa de Oaxaca. It's the one that I always have to go to. And it's um, it's right in town center. They make sauces right at the table with crickets and everything else that you want. You can decide your own heat level for my Eastern European friends on the call. And, um, and there's, uh, in Mexico City, everybody should know about this one. I mean, it's not everybody, I guess, but it's the Pujols. Pujols. We just, I took the team over there not too long ago. I think we were there about three weeks ago. And it was a six hour dining experience. Wow. You have no say in what's going on. And I think they were laying it on a little heavy for us because I mean, I'm telling you, it's like maybe 13 courses. Wow. Oh my gosh. Pujols to go with every single one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, it was, uh, those restaurants are both fantastic. But when, back to Oaxaca though, literally, I, I was there what two weeks ago and what you do when you're in Oaxaca is you go check out the art galleries and the markets um you drink a maize and mezcal you mm -hmm. eat and then you repeat like that's all you do wow I, I had maybe I, I like no in two days we went to at least nine restaurants I, I get yeah because I gained nine pounds so let's just say a pound per restaurant <laughs> um but it, it is there, there's, there was not one bad experience. There was not one mediocre experience. The person that I was with was saying, hey, dude, you need to open up a restaurant out here. And I was like, why? So I <laughs> kill my confidence? Like, they're, they're too good. They're, they're amazing out there. So if you go to Oaxaca, if you're in town center, you can't lose. Okay. I don't know if you guys can see that. I went ahead and plated it while you were there. Ooh. And I dragged out one of my grandmother's plates. Um, and basically put the slaw on and the fish and then a little bit of caviar on top. It is all vegetable, all forward, all Texas, all summer, right there on a plate. Oh, you guys can't see my counter anymore. Yeah, yeah. That's because my cell phone died. Yay! Oh, no. <laughs> so how about this? Ah, uh, nice. That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. There we go. That's beautiful stuff. That is beautiful. Thank you, Chef. I can't wait to have your song like that. You know that that's going to have to happen to me, right? 
<laughs> yeah, but I mean, only got one slice left over here. Uh, oh, yeah. did you eat? Yeah, I mean, I took the cues from you the other day. <laughs> <laughs> I did, I did. But yeah, that like I said, that that dish in particular just reminds me completely of my my grandparents and and both of their the sides of their their families coming together on a on a on a single plate. Okay, that is fantastic. Thank you both. So we we I think we have about five minutes left. I've tried to ask some of the questions that I see in the chat um, for questions. To, uh, here's one that came in very early. I think for both of you. So it says across the U.S., restaurant owners have complained about the lack of people wanting to work now. Has that been your experience? I guess mostly directed to Chef Chris. Uh, has that been your experience? And do you see the differences with BIPOC applicants, workers? Hmm. What's a BIPOC? Black, indigenous, people of color. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so we were fortunate enough to where when the pandemic started, we didn't, we kept 100% of our staff on. Uh, we made that determination at the very beginning. We kept them all at an average salary of what they were making. We put a little wage, we put everybody on salary. So fortunately enough, we don't, we don't have those kind of issues, <clears throat> but every other restaurant, every industry period has those issues. Yeah, it's, it's, bad across, it's bad across the board. Everybody's got open recs, you know, and, and even bringing back the staff that they have had, it's, 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 it's been, a, it's, so, I would say it's terrible. <laughs> so what we're doing is with the, the 1913 is we're, we're creating that, that workforce for restaurants. So that, that whole thing that I was telling you about, so we're bringing people in, introducing them to the culinary world from seed all the way up. Right. The program works in six week intervals. So they really get to see the full reality of kitchens. The only thing that's, that they're spared from is the reality of paying kitchens because mm -hmm. we start them up at such a premium of $12. Um, but that being said, when they come out of there, they have the culinary education that I wish I would have had when I first got into the game. So we're looking to combat that and create this, uh, this amazing, passionate workforce because I mean, they're working for me right now. Um, and they're, 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 they're in it. They're enjoying it. Yeah. So Chef Joe, I think here's a question specifically about your dish. Uh, any particular filled peas to use in place of purple whole peas? Um, I, I've never actually done that. And I see that's the wonderful Nancy McDermott and asking that question. Hello, Nancy. Um, you know, could you use Camellia's, uh, Camellia's uh, field peas? Um, you, you absolutely could. I think, you know, in that case, you know, you're just, you're going to get them dry and you just have to, 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 to cook those and then you're gonna end up draining them uh, pretty well anyway. Um, but you know, it, the idea with that salad is that you can use any sort of pea that you have, as long as it's been you know, cooked and, and, and strained really well. I mean, use whatever's local to you. And that's, that's part of the whole point. It's just that you know, corn scraped right off the cob, black eyed peas, uh, purple hole peas, you know, we're pre, there, I mean, there's a purple hole pea festival in Newton County near the Freedman Colony where, where, where my, my great grandmother's uh, family, my grandmother, great grandmother's family was from. I mean, literally it's, it's in their neighborhood. So that's all we ever saw with purple peas. <sighs> so are there any, I don't think that there are any other questions and I see 819 and I think we're supposed to end at 820. So. Oh, look at that. We magically pulled that off or skillfully, however you want to look at it, but uh, we we are just about there. I, I just have a question actually that I would love all of you, including you, Dr. Davis. I just want to know how you feel about today, about Juneteenth becoming a national holiday today. I'll, I'll lead if you want. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm just uncomfortable with the term holiday. I think it needs to be a day of uh, recognition and um, Joy has a much better word for it, but mm. I don't think that it's something that needs to be celebrated in the traditional sense. It's not like Fourth of July, <laughs> you know. What I mean, this is this is a completely different kind of thing, and uh, we just have to be hyper aware of the repercussions of what happened and the fact that slavery didn't end on Juneteenth. It actually was, you know, Delaware was the last holdout uh, state in the Union, and 
even then with them, slavery didn't end, it just went underground. Right. Uh, then they started a whole different type of oppression. Uh, so I just think it needs to be a day of recognition um, and just to know like where we are and the, the damage has been done, the trauma, and that it takes a while to recover from something like that. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, you think about any other civilization, a hundred years after that kind of trauma is nothing. Yeah. I, I, I use the phrase, it has to be a day of atonement um, and recognition, as Chris says, it has both, it has two sides. There is joy in understanding freedom and family change. Um, and then there is something knowing that there was utter destruction and devastation to your families simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And you know, if that's, you know, doing a day of service, if that is um, getting together just with your family and talking about your family members or, you know, being in that unit, you know, for me, that's still, that still is where it started and where it began, you know. We'll have a walk uh, here in Austin from MLK statue to, in, which is on the east side of University of Texas where I went to school, but it goes all the way to our HBCU Houston Tillotson on the east side of town. And that's a marker. And I think that's a really important marker. And that day is a marker. I'm glad that others want, because the nation has not had a day to recognize and reflect and acknowledge what happened here, um, that others want to latch on to this day that was specific to Texans. Um, and I, under I understand that. How, we have to have a day where we irrevocably destroyed a structure and created something else and went to go live, live up to the promise, to start to live up to the promise that, that, that was here and written in the original documents. Yeah, I, I, I think both of you have said that just so eloquently. And you know, the only thing I would add is just critical reflection. And, and I think that that's really what has happened here today is, is to think about what these connections are and what the legacies are and you know, as, as Chef Chris and both Chef Joy noted, that day, the 19th, really was in some ways another day. And even embedded in the language of the general order, it's ushering in, you know, enslavement by another name. So we have to always, you know, be mindful of sort of du the duality of the African American experience in this country, that there there's always that sort of subtlety there that that underlies, you know, what we talk about as freedom. Thank you so much, all of you. Um, just one final question I saw in the chat was, are there any other uh, Juneteenth food book recommendations? Food book? Um, I know that Nicole Taylor has a, a Juneteenth cookbook coming out, but I think it's one. next year. Yeah, I heard about that one as well. I mean, outside of Jubilee, I will let, I will let the good professor answer that one. Do we, we don't get to read anymore, you guys. And for that one, I mean, I think I gave mine. Mine is all local, embedded in Galveston, all about Galveston. So the, the local restaurants, for me, that's going to be my recommendation. And, you know, you've already mentioned Jubilee. Um, yeah, I don't know that I can offer anything beyond those. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, 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 again, it's not really about foods that were done for Juneteenth. But if you just want to think about um, historical, I mean, American, which they are, African-American, American food's pretty much the same thing when you think about the genesis of this country. Uh, yeah. You can look at uh, another book by Lutita Martin, which is uh, uh, The Jemima Code, which chronicles uh, recipes from black chefs and cookbooks uh, from the late 1800s. Yeah. The early 1900s. So that, that's a and, good one. And my favorite is still the works of Edna Lewis. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Um, and any of, any of her texts come back to this food. Definitely. And, um, you know, I know some of you mentioned that you watched High on, the High on Netflix, but I, I definitely encourage you to go to the source material and, and read the book by Dr. Jessica Harris, who yeah. 
A little plug for MOFAD. Um, Dr. Harris is the lead curator of our exhibition that I mentioned, African slash American. So I hope you will all be able to come visit that when it opens in the fall. Come to New York. Um, and of course, you know, our friends in Texas, we're so grateful that you spent time with us this evening. I hope I can come to Texas and visit all of you. And sure. never, you know, I need that Solomon Gundy. Um, there's so many affirmations right now in the chat. Thank you all so much for being a part of this. Thank you for the beautiful recipes you shared. Um, Dr. Davis, thank you so much for your, your skillful moderation and your expertise. It was such an honor. And mostly I'm just so grateful for this really, uh, this really candid conversation, because I know a lot of the Juneteenth um, narrative gets gets you know kind of muted by this this celebration and um, you know this this conjecture of everyone wanting to be part of something that feels really festive. So I really really appreciate just this honesty, and um, it was I learned a lot. And thank you uh, so much, to everyone, for for being a part of it. Um, so I think that's it for tonight. I'll send you all an email tomorrow with the recordings. You can go back, uh, the recipes, and of course, all the contact information for our panelists tonight. So good night. Come back soon to our next event, I hope. Um, take care. Continue to stay safe and be good to one another. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye.